Good evening. Welcome to Outside the Game. I have a very special guest I happen to be sitting beside today. Um, not only is a great friend of mine, man, but he is uh, a legend in the area. Um, Tyrone Jones. First of all, I appreciate the man coming out and talking to me this evening out your busy schedule. Tyrone Jones attended Dunbar Senior High School in Washington, D.C. Okay. Uh, he was a Parade All-American in 1984. He left Dunbar and went to Hutchinson Community College. All right. He left Hutchinson Community College and would have played for Oklahoma University for two years. Okay. In 1988, his team was 35 and 4. And they played in the national championship game where they lost to uh, Danny Manning and the Kansas Jayhawks. In 89, their record was 30 and 6. And they lost in the Sweet 16 to Virginia. So, first of all, Stretch, I want to congratulate you, man, on having an outstanding. Um, legendary career. You know, you're a legend from the area. Everybody says you're one of the best shooters. Not only best shooters, but gets all around best players from the area. So I just wanted to congratulate you on that, man, on the outstanding career. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And I also like to congratulate you on your due diligence to have all this information <laughs> and this documentation that you got here. Hey, I appreciate it, man. Listen, when I when I when you find when you agreed to do it, I had to do your do the do roses, man. Give you your roses, man, to do my due diligence to know what I'm talking about before you come mm -hmm. in for gracing your appearance on my show, man. So I really appreciate that. So we're gonna jump right into it. What was the first time you picked up a basketball and what drawn you to the game as a youngster? Okay, like about nineteen seventy four, seventy five. I was living in Northeast over in Edgewood Terrace in Northeast. Mm -hmm. And I went to Shade Elementary School, Allison Ernestine Shade Elementary School. Okay. And when I lived up Edgewood, I stayed on the basketball court. They had like a one basketball court out there and they had like a full court, uh, you know, just up by the swimming pool. Mm -hmm. But all the older guys were on there. I was like about nine or 10. But I would go up there and play sometime with them. And they older guys would let me play because I could play with them. So me realizing I liked the game and all that, I was at Shade Elementary School. And there was uh, the uh, physical education teacher there. His name was Willie Green. And I played on the football team. I wasn't really in the basketball as much as I was in the football at that time. Mm -hmm. But... I played football. We won the city title in elementary school uh, football touch. We played touch. There wasn't no tackle. Mm -hmm. So one day I was in the school building, and I was on, like, the second floor in the school, and he came walking by, and he because we had just won the championship in, you know, elementary football. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, he said, uh, yeah, we got practice this evening, you know, 3 o'clock, you know, so be on time, you know, like that. So I'm looking at him. I'm like, Coach, we just won the championship in football. What you mean be on right. time? He said, no, nah, no, nah, I'm talking about basketball. I said, Coach, I ain't never played on no team before. He said, oh, no, 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 you can play. You can play basketball like that. So I went to like two or three practices and everything. And I saw, you know, I really liked it and everything. Mm -hmm. So we had a game. And the first game I played with them, I was the first substitution in the game. And I hit a bucket and I was hooked. That was it. That's all it took. <laughs> that first bucket. Yeah, I that made one. Bucket. I made a layup. Mm -hmm. And that was all it took, you know. And I was hooked in line and sinker. Mm -hmm. Okay, from there, I went over to number nine boys club. Mm -hmm. Over there, it was in Stewart Junior High School. This was like 1975. Okay. Right? So I was on the 10 and under team. I played for a coach's name was Mr. Rebel, a number nine boys club. And at that time, at that boys club, players, they were great players over there playing like 14 and under and 16 and under and I was on the 10 and under. The players were Bo Holston, Sidney Lowe, mm -hmm. and Terry Tibbs. Mm -hmm. They were over there, you know, at that time. So, you know, that's like, you know, pretty much the gist of my, you know, offspring into basketball right there. So, as you were doing that, were there some obstacles growing up in D.C.? Because, you know, it, it was a pretty rough city to grow up in sometimes off the court. You know, were, were there some obstacles that you had to, you know, duck and dodge so that you can stay on, on, on your course? Absolutely. But see, me, for me personally, I was never a follower. I never followed anybody. You know, look, look, when I'm telling you I was 10 years old and I played for Stewart, 
I mean, not Stewart, but number nine boys club. I was living in Edgewood Terrace. I would walk from Edgewood Terrace at 10 years old all the way over to Northeast to Stewart uh, Middle School by myself at 10 years old just because I like basketball that much. But now let me tell you, even though I was 10, I was a little tall and it was different times then, you know, that a, you know, a young person could do that kind of thing, you know, wouldn't be bothered or. You know, somebody would do something Some to you. Tool. Wasn't no yeah. murdering and killing and mm -hmm. drugs and all that wasn't around at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a different climate, different atmosphere at that time. You know, and you know, the people that were mentoring us, like the, you know, they, this was the Metropolitan Police Boys Club at the time, mm -hmm. and those people that worked in the boys club, like number nine, number eleven, number twelve, number ten, number six, and number four mm -hmm. down southwest, uh, Willie Borden. Those people were really interested in young people and all that. And they, you know, kind of pretty much made sure that we stayed the straight and narrow and stayed on the course, you know, of, you know, just being a good, you know, student, a good kid and all that. You couldn't, you know, wasn't all that. You couldn't act out and all that. Because see, back then, the boys club, you remember now, they had that paddle. That's right. They were, they were right. yeah, they had that yeah, paddle. paddle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Of, amongst that time, when did it all start coming together? Like before you got the house, when did you know that okay, this might be something I can really, I can really go further with? When did you know you was going, you good, and it started clicking? The eighth grade. Eighth grade. Okay, eighth grade. I left uh, uh, Shade Elementary School. Mm -hmm. My mother and then we moved over southeast. Mm -hmm. I went to Washington Highland okay. Elementary School. Okay. Okay. By this time, it's like nineteen seventy seven. I'm in the sixth grade, and I played on the team. You know, we played Kramer, Jefferson, all them Douglas, Johnson. Mm -hmm. All of us was in the same, you know, division, mm -hmm. right? So, man, I noticed, you know, I was the lead scorer for friendship, you know, that you and I was, you know, doing that. But I really liked the game, and I knew that I could do some things on the court. But a lot of things, like a lot of people didn't know, I used to practice a lot by myself, right? Mm -hmm. But... The jump shot that I developed, I'm going to tell you how I developed my jump shot. This that is was, no joke. That was going to be a question I asked you because you are a legendary shooter. So tell them some of the things you did and how you developed it. Okay. Back during that time, I was a huge Bullets fan, right? My favorite player was Phil Chenier. Phil Chenier, yeah. And if you look at my jump shot and you look at his, they are identical because I'm going to tell you what I did. I was like 10, 11 years old. Back then, you could go downtown mm -hmm. and where it was the, you remember, it was the Woodworth, the Woodworth and Loafer, mm -hmm. or the heck, one of them. Heck Mall or whatever that nah, was over there. No, nah, it was the Wood, right there on, I'll tell you where it's at. It's something else now, like that 21 and all that's in there. It's right there uh, where that uh, wax museum is now. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. right there. Okay. Right? Okay. A bus used to come right there mm -hmm. to take people to the Capitol Center back then. Like 19, this is like 1976, 77, right in there. And if the ride, I think it was like 25 cents and you could get a ticket to the Wizards game. I mean, where they was booked the for $5, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Man, I used to save my money, right? And all that. I would go down there by myself. Well, it was a kid that played with me in elementary school. His name was Michael Kennedy. He went to shade with me. Me and him used to go down there and catch that bus and go out to the Capitol Center. We would get out there so early that I could, I would slip all the way down to the floor and I would sit down there on the floor and I would watch and study Phil Chenier, right? I said, okay. I said, he goes up, he goes up. And I said, when he get to the top of that joint, he lets it go. And I used to go down Friendship and all of that and up Highland when I was, um, you know, growing up and everything. And I would emulate Phil Chenier and all that. And till I really perfected it. How many jump shots did you shoot today? Back then I was a kid. I think I was shooting maybe 150, something like that, 200. But all that increased over the years mm -hmm. and with time. Once I saw I could shoot it, you know, mm -hmm. and all that thing. But it was uh, Phil Chenier that was the spark behind the jump shot who I studied, you know, shot to develop my shot. Mm -hmm. And for the, all, those of you who may not know, you may want to check Phil Chanel out. He was a bad mama jamma. <laughs> this is before, I mean, but he's not really talked about when he's talking in that time. Mm -hmm. When you talk about some of the greatest players, a lot of times he's overlooked. But, oh, he, yeah. but he was definitely, definitely uh, real smooth. I, I, real I smooth. liked his game. Uh, you know, at that time, Dr. J was a star mm -hmm. and all that, but I mostly gravitated 
to Phil Chanel because I knew I couldn't hold a ball like Dr. J and yeah, dunk like that, that, that and yeah, do all that, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, hanging in the air. And I yeah. didn't have the jumping ability, you know, yeah, that, like that, yeah. you know, at that age. You know, I was like, what, 11, 12, 13, mm -hmm. right in there, mm -hmm. you know. So tell me what happened when you uh, went to Dunbar. Um, what happened? What was your career like? What was your team like? Tell me a little bit what, what happened when you went to Dunbar. Okay. Uh, I left. I left Friendship when I was in the eighth grade. And I transferred to Langley Junior High School, and I played for Jay Shorter at Langley Junior High School. And he was a real good coach for middle school. I mean, he's the best. Look, he's still doing it now. He done went undefeated the last three years at Jefferson Middle School in Southwest. Mm -hmm. So he really mentored me, you know, uh, helped me formulate my game and all that. Now, he was the first person. Now, I was a center for Langley. I played center because I at this time – you know, when I'm in the, in the ninth grade, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting this height that I am now. Correct. So he played me at center. But he came to me and told me, he said, look, you're not going to be a center in high, I mean, in, in high school or college. So he started running plays where he would put me at the top of the key and he would run me through the offense and run me to the corner. And the guards would throw me the ball in the corner and I would shoot the jumper. Right. And all that because he knew I had a shot. And so he would let me shoot my jumper. He would let me play on the perimeter, you know, and get used to playing on the perimeter. Mm -hmm. So when I left him and went to Dunbar, I had no problem adjusting to the high school game. Correct. And I started for Dunbar in the 10th grade, my 10th grade year. Wow. I started. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That was like 1982. That was 81, 82. 81, 82, uh -huh. I thought so. Okay. We had a real good team. Robbie Gant, mm -hmm. Bernard Campbell, John Taylor, Mike Millen, Scooby Campbell, and the legendary coach, Jodine Davis, was our mm -hmm. coach. One of the best coaches of all time in this area. Mm -hmm. So let, let's talk about 84. What mm -hmm. happened in 84? Uh, I know you were a parade All-American mm -hmm. in 84. Um, talk a little bit about that senior se senior se season, and you know, was it a lot of fanfare? Did you have a lot of college chasing you? What was the pressure like during that '84 season? Well, I pretty much was on every top forty players in the country. Correct. You know, my senior year, and I was pretty much recruited by all the top schools. Mm -hmm. But I, I, you only could get four visits, mm -hmm. so I visited uh, Kansas, uh, Maryland. Syracuse mm -hmm. and Kentucky. Okay. okay. I visited, those were my four visits. Okay. You know? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So how did you end up at Hutchinson? Because you went to Hutchinson Community College, correct? First. first. Yeah. No. Right. I first left Dunbar and mm -hmm. went to the University of Kansas. Jayhawks with Larry Brown. Okay. Right? Okay. Now, I went out there. It was pretty much a culture shock to me and everything. And then on top of it, I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And Larry Brown was a very good guy, good man to me and all that. But I was messing up in school and I didn't want to, you know, do anything, you know, to bring anything bad on him. Mm -hmm. And I knew I had bad grades and all that because I wasn't going to class. It was me, you know, and all that. So I went to him and I told him, you know, that I wanted to leave. You know, and all that. I wasn't going to go into what it was about right. and all that. Right. But he still wanted me to stay and all that. Mm -hmm. But I knew I was on the possibility if I stayed, I would have flunked out. Wow. So I told him that and he they checked everything out and for me, whatever. And so they, you know, pretty much got me, you know, in the junior college, you gotcha. know, Hutchinson Community College. And I went there. Right. So what, when you ended up there, what was what was what was your mindset like? Because you had just made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and you went to Hutchinson and I'm sure that, you know, wasn't where you planned on being. You, right. did, you never expected that at that point in your career that you would find yourself messing up and be there. So what was your mindset like and what was the best experience that you got from there? What did you learn from there? And, uh, because obviously you learned something because you went on to Oklahoma. Right. So what, what did you learn from, from Hutchinson and that experience? OK, I went to Hutchinson, you know, from um, uh, Kansas. Uh, Kansas. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the grade thing and all that. Mm -hmm. All right, my initial plan was mm -hmm. only to stay there one year, right? right. And I was okay. thought I was going to be able to go back to Kansas, right? right? Okay. Well, that was the plan. And after that one year at Hutchinson, I had a good year. I, you know, I think I averaged about 17 points, about five, six rebounds. Mm -hmm. Again, we went to the national uh, 
title. 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 Mm -hmm. I mean, now we went to the, yeah, the national tournament. Mm -hmm. We lost in the uh, semifinals to Lidio Echols and San Jacinto. Wow, okay. Right, Tyrone Shaw. For the Bullets. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, San Jacinto. Yeah. Mitch Richmond was out there playing in that tournament at, at the wow. same time. He was playing with Mobile League Community College, right? Okay, okay. At that time, right. Wow. And all, you know, all of us made the all-tournament team mm -hmm. uh, in the National Junior College Tournament, right? Mm -hmm. So my initial plan was to return back to Kansas after one year at Hutchinson. So, you know, I was talking to Larry Brown and all that. But at this, by this time, they had recruited over me, you know, that position. They recruited Archie Marshall. Now, let me tell you this. This this one I knew that Larry Brown was a true friend to me. He told me that. Wow. And he told me that Archie Marshall was going to play that three spot for me. And that I needed, you know, to go somewhere the way I was going to be able to play and that I was going to start wow. and get playing time, right? That's so. I never held any, you know, ill feelings for him, you know, not accepting me back at Kansas at that time and all that because, you know, that was, you know, his team and he had to move on because, you know, I understood it, you know, and all that. I wasn't bitter or nothing like that. But it was part of my motivation to go to Oklahoma, though, to play against him, too, though. To, so, to you know, for that. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get yeah. that. <laughs> but they all end up burning me as well to get into that later. Okay. All yeah. right. So explain for – um the kids that may be watching too, because you went from uh, explain the differences of practices and on the level of how hard you got to work for from because you went from Dunbar to Hutchinson. I mean, or uh, the Kansas to Hutchinson. What was the difference like when you made them 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 of uh, the moves? You know, because coming from Dunbar, what was the big adjustments and what was the adjustment from from uh, Hutchinson going to Oklahoma? What was the practice style like? Was it more intense? Uh, did you have to work harder? Tell the kids a little bit more uh, of the big differences because sometimes I don't think kids understand how difficult it is when you're going from high school to college and, and how you got to prepare for that game. Well, first and foremost, let me tell you this about pretty much college basketball. When the college basketball coach says that practice is at 3 o'clock, he don't mean you come walking on the floor at 3 o'clock. That means you're on the floor dressed and ready to go at, at 3. three so it's way more structured. Everything is uniform. The practice is on paper. We don't see the paper, right. you know, because they, they don't have. want us to know what's going on. Right, but they have. But it pretty much flows, you know, mm -hmm. right through mm -hmm. and everything. And, you know, you start out, you know, doing drills and all that kind of thing. You know, then we break into groups, the guards, the forwards, mm -hmm. the centers. They all work with a, a coach, coach right. that's, you know, doing stuff for them to help them, you know, to be able to, you know, be better at their position. Mm -hmm. And they showing them things, teaching things and all those uh, sorts of things. You know, that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. But the biggest difference I've seen from, you know, pretty much uh, high school and college basketball it's just more structured, okay. you know, and, you know, it's more structured. More it's more, and it's more business, mm -hmm. like a business, yes. you know. Yes, yes, Uh So now you get, like we go to 88, when you get mm -hmm. to Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys end up going 35 and 4 and 88, right? Yeah. You had a bullseye on your back all year, mm -hmm. right? And in that year, you had three impressive win streaks, mm -hmm. 14 games, mm -hmm. 12, mm -hmm. and 9 in a row mm -hmm. on the way to the national championship game. Along the way, you played guys like Purvis Ellison, Danny Manny, Chris Jackson, better known as Abdul Raouf, Stanley Roberts, Sean Elliott, Steve Kerr. You played against a host of people, oh, yeah. you know, on that. To me, though, I'm going to tell you, the best player I played against in college. I was going to ask you that. Was Willie Anderson, played at Georgia. Willie Flipping Anderson? Yeah, played for, for the for Spurs. Spurs. Yes. He, to me, wow. me and him became real good friends, too. Okay. He was probably the best player, most skilled player that I've seen in college. I was wild by him. Mm -hmm. He was a phenomenal college player, right? Wow. And all that. He was probably the best that I've seen. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I like Sean Elliott and all those other guys you mm -hmm. named, mm -hmm. but he was pretty much the best. Now, let me not sell the player, the teammates that I had that played with me. I was, just I, about, to, I was about to get to that. Let me get let to me that. Let me not sell them short. Oh, yeah, because you played with, in 88, you had Harvey Grant, Stacey King, and Mookie Blaylocks. And yourself. And Ricky and Grace. Ricky Dave Grace. Seager. So my, my question for you. So throughout up until that time, you were usually the man mm -hmm. at, on your team. Right. So coming in 88, you had them three guys that you knew were going to be the linchpin of everything. Right. right. So 
what was the adjustment like because you was used to having being a volume shooter, having a ball in your right. hand, and now you come to a situation where it's not just a good team, it's a lot of expectations for you guys. Right. You guys are expected to win. How did you how how did you make that adjustment to playing with those guys on the court? Going from a guy who used to having the ball all the time, and now you were kind of a, a role player more, so to speak. Well, I was already in training for that. Okay. And let me tell you what I mean. See, I went to Dunbar because Dunbar at that time was the prestigious program along with the Matha mm -hmm. and you know some other you know teams in the area, but mainly at that time, it was Dunbar and the Matha. Mm -hmm. Both of us, you know, would get great players. So mm -hmm. I'm already used to playing right. with guys I had to share the ball with. Gotcha. Right? Okay. So I didn't, I, I never wanted to be a big fish in a small pond. Yes, I wanted to be able to play with other good players mm -hmm. and all that. Now, when I went to Oklahoma, I knew I had already played against Mookie Blaylock. Okay. Harvey Grant in junior college. Both of them played junior college. I went there. I picked Oklahoma specifically because they were there. And I knew he was going to win. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to play with guys and I wanted to win. I'm a competitor. I'm, I don't care, you know, how good somebody else is and how good that player is. I'm going to mesh my game and all that and we're going to flow together and we're going to develop chemistry and play, you know, good basketball together. Mm -hmm. So on, on that team, how did you guys manage with so many different personalities and egos? Because you guys were all good. How did you guys mesh together? Was it an easy fit? Did you guys fit together real good? Or were there some adjustments at some point during the season? Or was it just a, a smooth transition? Well, let me put it this way. A couple of us hung with each other and dealt with us. A lot of us didn't, though. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to tell you one thing about these guys. Mm -hmm. That when we got on that court, we were in unity with each other. We got along on that basketball court, no matter what, because we wanted to win. That's right. You know? Yep. I mean, certain guys didn't like each other. Sure, that happens on teams Absolutely. and all of that. That happens. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to tell you something about that team. You say we lost four games, right? I'm going to tell you a secret. A lot of people don't know. Two of those losses were back-to-back. -back. Wow. We lost to LSU in New Orleans mm -hmm. at in New Orleans, right? At the University of New Orleans, right? I think Missouri was one of them. I, I yeah, read about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we lost. No, we lost to K State first. Okay. Then the next game was at LSU. They beat us. We lost back to back, right? Okay. When we got back, we had a meeting and everything. We had a coming together. So we just had to refocus mm -hmm. and recharge mm -hmm. and then we was went bam right back on another winning streak yeah. because when when you are when you have a highly talented team like that too you're getting everybody best shot every night yeah everybody's getting up to play you so that's why i said you're, you're, you guys had a bulls out on your back all year because if, if i'm but, not mistaken you was in the top 10 all year if I'm no, no 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 okay. no look we, we 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 wasn't even in the top 10 then okay at that time, nobody started recognizing us to after that, those losses, when we took off again. Okay. We okay. wasn't even in the top. If you look it up, the top 10, or you look it up before those two losses, mm -hmm. LSU and Kansas State, we were not in nobody's top 10. Wow. We barely just cracked the top 25 at this time. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So how did things change for you off the court? 88 because Dylan did were there some adjustments or some things that you know you had to adjust to because you were I'm sure you got more attention you know you were on a highly talented team did how did things change for you off the court did you have to make any adjustments you talking about far as when I was at the school yeah in 88 during the 88 season after you know because you know you got a lot of attention y'all was always I'm sure writings and the papers and stuff was there a lot too how did you focus how did you remain focused throughout all the chatter and, and then people telling you how good you were? How did you stay focused? Was there anything you had to do off the court? Well, no, nah, not really because, I'm like I said, just told you, we wasn't really talked about the early. Early. You know right. what I'm saying? Okay. We wasn't. Okay. You know, and we just like surprised everybody, mm -hmm. you know, and everything. And nobody, you know, and I think if you look at the preseason ranking, mm -hmm. 1988, I don't even think we might even wasn't ranked. Wow. I only think we were right, you know, coming into that season. Yeah. And we went 35 and 4. And and what's really impressive is, like I told you, we was talking before the show, and they have you guys as one of the best mm -hmm. college teams ever. Well, absolutely. We we averaged a lot of points. You know, Billy Ball, Billy Tubbs was the coach. Mm -hmm. 
at Oklahoma at the time, we played a thing called Billy Bowl. Yeah, when Billy that. Tubbs, you know, used to play, mm -hmm. you know, tells him, hey, break the score clock. Mm -hmm. But hey, we were very good defensively. Mm -hmm. We had Mookie Blaylock out there out front. Clamping. And Harvey Grant was a great uh, uh, defensive player. Real and, uh, and, you know, Stacey King was a great defensive player and a rebounder. Harvey, I think Harvey and Stacey averaged double figures and rebounds and points. Mm -hmm. You know, so that was a you know, big uh, part of our team. We were a smothering team on defense. We could score, but we shut people down too. Mookie Blaylock wouldn't, wouldn't let certain, you know, guards couldn't get up court. They would switch their point guard so many times during the game. Mookie Blaylock, you know, created confusion. Mm -hmm. I remember we played in the tournament that year, 88, where they went from this guard, I, I can't remember, Williams or something. He was left-handed, mm -hmm. right? Now, by the game in, LeBranford Smith was playing the point because Mookie had messed his kid up so bad, he couldn't dribble up the court anymore. They took him out. They had to take him out. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's the Mookie terrorized that kid. That, that's the true definition of strapping somebody up right there. <laughs> yeah, but Mookie did that on the regular though. Mm -hmm. A lot of guards. Mm -hmm. He was a thief. Uh, 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 he was a thief. He could steal the ball, man. He was real tricky with that. Now I'm gonna tell you something about Mookie. When I first met him, you know, one of the first things he told me, yes, and look, this blew my mind. Now we talking, we ride. He driving. We in the car. He, he, I'm just riding with him. He driving, right? So we sitting in there, and uh, we talking basketball and whatever. He looked over at me and said, yeah, man, uh, I steal the ball. <laughs> I looked at him. I said, you steal the ball? Right. What, what? I said, okay. You know, I said, well, I score the ball. <laughs> like that, right? <laughs> now, watch this. We go and we play pickup with each other, the team and all this, right? We playing basketball and all that. He on the other team. And I'm, we just, you know, we have free play in August. We scrimmaging. Right. Man, nobody can get up court. I said, I'm scratching my head. I said, oh, man, that's what he was talking about. Wow. It was incredible wow. that he could steal the basketball. He had the quickest feet that I ever seen, man, from point A to point B. He would fake a dude over here, and by the time the person like went behind his back and was over there, Mookie was right there Cut getting off. that jump and going the other way, down the court, scoring a layup, man. Wow. So – after that 88 season, um, we talked about it ended in a loss to uh, Danny Manning and the Kansas Jayhawks. Going into the 89 season, what was your mentality like? Because you guys still uh, had a lot of returning people from mm -hmm. that team. Harvey Grant was the only one to go on, right? Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. so you, you, Mookie, and Stacy, you guys returned for another year. So what was your mindset like going in 89? And I'm sure you probably had a bigger role right. to prepare for, too. Right. So talk about the mindset and how you got prepared for that season. Well, I, well, that season I stayed out there, and I stayed you know, out at the University of Oklahoma, and I was you know, getting in shape. And everything, because you know this was my senior year coming up, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be ready and prepared for the season. So I stayed out there, worked on my game, and everything. You know, you know, try to work on my rebounding, ball handling, you know, and other things, passing, and all that. For me, it was all about the team at all the time. I never really, you know, anybody to tell you that played with me. I, I never was a selfish ball player. You know what I'm saying? I always shared the basketball because I like winning more than I like individual accolades or any of that kind of thing, right? Any player that played with me would tell you that about me. I shared the basketball. I was not a greedy player. I was not a, a high volume, you know, shooting player from the field. You know, I, I wouldn't shoot no 20 shots and all that, whatever. I, I take at the most at the most 13 or 14 shots a game. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just efficient. You I know, say you I, were very efficient. Yeah, Rick. You I, shot in half 40s and 50s. Yeah, for, I shot like about 46% right in there. And I was a jump shooter. I played on the perimeter. So that's huge. You yes. Know? yes. Uh, I averaged like about 13, 14 points a game my senior year mm -hmm. at Oklahoma, about six rebounds, five, you know, five, six rebounds mm -hmm. and all that, you know. But my main objective and all that was winning. I cared about the team. And all that. And I wanted our team to go as uh, far as we could. Mm -hmm. Because, see, the game of basketball, man, is a game of cooperation, right? If you're trying to win, you got to cooperate with the game. Take what the game gives. Mm -hmm. you, you, know, you know, see, anybody that knows basketball, and if you're watching the game, like a person like me, I know the game. I could tell when a player went outside of what that team structure is and what they're doing. Now, you got... Some players, they are great 
at what they can do, and they are able and capable mm -hmm. to finish though when they do that. Right. Now, if you're a player, you know, you Allen Iverson mm -hmm. and all this, okay, that's going to be acceptable. Well, you know, like I say, Allen Iverson, the only player you that John Thompson let do that. Correct. You know, so <laughs> Correct. when you got a player that, you know, is of that skill set mm -hmm. and of that level that he can go and get a bucket, that's not uh, ball hogging or nothing like that. It may be uh, what they call in uh, music improvising. Mm -hmm. Like you come down, we run in the play. But right. the play break down. But the other team don't know that the play break down, Correct. but we do. Correct. So it's a thing like they use in music when they tell a, a bad, you know, all right, we're going to be improvising, but they still going. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Okay, that's the same thing in basketball. You know, now a lot of people look at basketball and they think it's a whole lot going on, right? And all that. It's not a whole lot going on. Guess what? You know how many plays we had? How many? Three. Wow. Three plays. Three to four. Plays. I ain't gonna tell Billy plays. I ain't gonna call him out nothing with that <laughs> and all that because I don't, you know, only like still his form. Make Billy tell rest in peace. Yes, definitely, yeah. definitely. And so that that was my next question for you. How was it playing for the late great Billy? I mean, he was. Um, he's always was talked about as being an outstanding coach, man. So uh, talk about what it was like to play for that, for play for him. Well, first and foremost, if you could play. And if you could do what you could do, he had no problem letting you do it. But if you couldn't do something, you're not going to do it on his team. For instance, what I'm talking about, if you can't shoot threes, you're not going to shoot threes. Right. You know what I'm saying? If you can't handle the ball, you're not going to be handling the ball. You're not going to be doing what you don't have the skill to do on his team. That's He just, you know, that. but he was a, a pretty much a fun coach to play with. And he, he also had a great sense of humor. He was a funny guy. You know, I really enjoyed playing for Coach Tubbs. Mm -hmm. So, at, at, at that 89 season, we said uh, you ended up losing in the Sweet 16 to Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, so, throughout that process at Oklahoma, if there was anything that you can do again, is there anything that you would do better? Right. One thing that I would do better. See, now it's a lot more information. YouTube. Correct. Uh, television, more games on TV. You can watch a lot and all that. If I had one thing to do, I would have been in the gym more. You know, like I tell players now when I work with them and all that, don't give back what you have gained. Like, you know, during the season, you in tip-top shape. All right, when the season over, you know, stay at that level. You know, don't give back your strength, conditioning, and condolence and all that that you have picked up during that year. Stay in basketball. I call it staying in basketball river. Yeah. Now, I didn't know nothing about that during that time. If It was an information thing. I trained to a couple of players and all that. And I was just testing my formula on them. And I made sure with these players, and they're two, two of them, they're in high school now. I'm not going to say their names because I don't want to put them on the spot. But they're going to tear, tear high school basketball up because I taught them this thing that I call staying in basketball rhythm. That stay in the gym. Don't give back what you have earned during the season by inactivity, mm -hmm. right? You just stay, you know, you just keep playing, you know, keep staying, keep getting better every day. Mm -hmm. You know, don't go long periods of time without putting your time in, in the gym. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot of kids and people watching right now that got dreams and aspirations of making it to play D1 basketball. Mm -hmm. um, is there some things that you, if there is there a few things that you would, uh, any, a few advice, a few things of advice you would give kids in trying to obtain that goal? Is there some things they should be doing and working on that they need to do to obtain that goal? Uh, first and foremost, uh, go wherever you can get a scholarship. I don't care if it's Division 15, right? Mm -hmm. Go anywhere right. where you can get a scholarship and play. Serge Ibaka, they found him. He ain't go none of them. You can play there fine. They, because the TV information is we're in a different age now. That's right. And different climate. Now, maybe if I did it over there and I was in this atmosphere, I go to I go to Pepperdine and just lay on the beach every day and stay in the gym. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and all that, because they're gonna find you, you know, Correct. wherever you at. Correct. You know, but my main message to young ball players, if you want to be good, take my message of staying in basketball rhythm. Don't be out of shape. At Look, at no time should you be out of shape if you're serious about the game, right? At all times, you should be ready to go. 
You know, if some if somebody comes and say, hey, let's go play. Oh, you should be ready to go to do what you normally do, you know, in developing your game. Always be ready. And how do you be ready? Stay in the gym. Stay working on your strength conditioning, your weaknesses. To attack what is weak in your game. Like if you're not a good shooter, work on your jump shot. If you're not a good ball handler, work on your ball handling. A lot of players tend to gravitate to their strengths instead of finding out what their weaknesses are and attack those weaknesses. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's some, that's some great advice. Uh, two other quick topics before I get you out of here. Um, this year they gets past the law name, image, and likeness. Right, uh, it uh, forces the college athlete to get paid. Um, talk about that on a little bit. Uh, do you think it's well overdue? Um, and also, from a perspective of the black athlete, because you know we social media and stuff like that, and having the ability to to get paid while you're in college is a huge thing, and it's a, and it's a platform that I feel like. As the black athlete, they need to take advantage of it uh -huh. because that opportunity is huge. It can lead to so many different avenues, uh, different avenues, and other many doors. So just expand and talk about that a little. Bit. Well, I really want to know if uh, we black we players from the past are we going to get it? Because hey, we went to the final four. Hey. That, that, that's so, all. That's look, a good. No, nah, but see, <laughs> see, it, it, look, it, was, it it made huge big money back even when I played, mm -hmm. and the players wasn't you know we, you know. You know, reaping any benefit. We used to get stuff called per diem and all that when we would play on the road and mm -hmm. all that. But that was pretty much it and all that. You know, when we played on the road and when we played in the tournament, it was real good in the tournament, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think it's long overdue because the revenue has grown tremendously since you know when we played, and these schools and universities are able to use these players' likeness and images and all that and make money. For instance, let's take a player like Zion Williamson, like a right. year and a half ago, right? Correct. I'm sure that Duke University made at least 12 million off of him alone. Yes. You know, off of him alone. Yes. So I think it's long overdue. The coaches don't like it because the coaches are used to having control mm -hmm. over the players psychologically and all of those kinds of things, mm -hmm. right? All right, now how you going to just say anything to this player? He getting paid, you know. And I'll, hey, coach, I just got a check for us. I ain't coming to practice today, you know. So what the coach going to do? Some of the power and control over players have been lost, you know, from the coaches. Now, when you look at it, coaches have contracts with shoe companies. But who's wearing the shoes? The players. Absolutely. You understand? Absolutely. So, I mean, the coach, but the coach, you know, at the university gets the money, you know, for those players who are wearing uh, the sneakers and all uh, those types of things, but and wearing the gear, you know, the Nike gear and all that. It's the players they show wearing it, but the coach reaps the benefit of getting paid for the players wearing this stuff. So I think that, you know, now that they need to change that too, and that the players, if they're wearing shoes, they should get some money from that also as well because they're allowing the players to get paid now. I agree. I agree. Uh, the transfer portal, do you, do you like it? Do you think it's fair? Absolutely. I'm going to show you why. Let's say, for instance, you coaching Miami University. Mm -hmm. I came there and played for you, Mike. I'm a sophomore. At the end of my sophomore year, you got the job back in Kentucky, paying you more money. And you left for what? A better opportunity, right? For you, right? That's right. Okay, why can't the player do the same thing? Now, and the reason that I number one, the number, my number one reason for this is this. When that new coach comes in there, he's inheriting somebody else's player. He did not bring those players in there, so he has no loyalty to them no, no. whatsoever. And guess what? A lot of people don't know this about college basketball. Scholarships are year to year. People holler, oh, he got a four-year ride. No, he don't. No, he don't. That coach can take that scholarship away from that player, and that player got to hit, got to leave and hit the road. The coach, the new coach, can do that. And you see, know that that affects so many kids' lives, too. Mm -hmm. and, and it could send that send them down the wrong path. Absolutely. Some, some some people aren't 
uh, like when you made a mistake, you had the fortitude mm. and to 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 re reset yourself re-establish. and reestablish yourself. Mm. Some kids don't have that foundation, mm-hmm. and and they aren't able to recover mm-hmm. from something like that mentally. Right, mentally, right. you mm-hmm. know. So I definitely agree with you because that they it's all- definitely a, a psychological gizmo for the player. Because that coach that left went there to that kid's house That's and right. talked to his parents. And told him, I'm going to take care of him. Yeah, and all this and that. Mm-hmm. But yet, he jetted on the jet skis. <laughs> you know, and he was yes. out of there. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, look, I think that in college basketball or football, mm-hmm. if the coach that recruited that kid and bought him their leave, that that player has the right, you know, to transfer and find better pastors for himself, like that coach did Correct. that found him for himself. That's right. Because I mean, ultimately, they they're doing what's better, for, what's best for themselves. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh-huh. That that I mean, we always say it's about the kids. Right. <laughs> that that's what you know. Yeah. That's that's what they say all the time. Yeah. So if it's really about the kids, they make it about the kids and, and don't hold them back from going to make a better decision for themselves when a coach has the ability to go because right. the coach because. See, what a lot of people don't see this as is for the coach, this is his his career goal to be a college head coach. This is how he lives. He feeds his family. He makes his living. Mm-hmm. See what I'm saying? So he's very serious about his job right. and all that. So that's why, like, when coaches, you know, get co- jobs at major division one and then see their number one objective is to get to that term, you know, and all that. You know, you have these major division one schools. I mean, you got really basically two years. You know, if you don't get that tournament, hey, might be out of there. Mm-hmm. Boom. That's it. And I've had, uh, you know, uh, Brian Hill. I mm-hmm. had Brian on the show. Mm-hmm. And he talked about how sometimes he he was pressured into playing. Like, if he was not at 100%, the coaches would be like, you know, they need him to play. Mm-hmm. You know, when it's time to make tournament games and, you know, and all that stuff, they, they, they want you to play. And, some, and he said sometimes he remember times where, you know, he pushed through things where he was just encouraged to play because, you know, he felt like he had to, it was a big game and they needed it. Right. Look, let me tell you this. College basketball coaches don't play with players. They got 30 games, right? They got 30 games to make that turn. Now, that's what the president, the athletic director, and all that uh, evaluate him on. Did we get to the turn? You get a coaching job and you're a new coach, Within two years, you better make that turn or you might be out of there because that's their ultimate objective to get to that turn. And that's how that goes, you know. So, and like, you know, like a lot of college coaches don't tolerate players who get in the game and be trying to do their own thing, you know, get on the floor doing all that. Because, hey, like I just said, that coach is trying to make that tournament. You're disrupting that by not playing the way he wants you to play and all that. You're affecting his livelihood. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I just want to tell you, man, it, uh, it, it's been a pleasure sitting here picking your picking that great mind. Man. Yeah, you man. know, uh, we've talked many times before, and I've always picked your mind, even when I was younger. Uh, you know, I always appreciated you encouraging me mm-hmm. when you saw me out there working by myself, yeah. doing things like you told me to do, yeah. put them shots up and get and get mm-hmm. the game up. Yeah. And I and thank you from DC, man, because I know that you are mental. Mm-hmm. to a lot of kids right. in our community, man. Mm-hmm. And we need it right now. Yeah. We, we need a lot of guys to step up and, and help these kids, man, and, and help them mentally, yeah. you know, and not just use them for their talents and see them going someplace, but to really care about the kids, man, and help them, and just so they can be successful human beings. Right. Well, my major message to, you know, young athletes in sports that play football, basketball, or any sport in college is – Hey, man, go to any school that you get a scholarship. The ultimate goal is to get a degree. That's right. And for me, that would be satisfactory enough for me that I see, you know, a young person or a young kid go to college and get a degree. I don't care if it's at Jablip University. As long as they go to school, finish, and get that degree. And, 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 it's, and you learn so much going away to college. It's mm-hmm. life experiences and, you know, you meet a whole different – uh, uh, ethnic of people, everything's different. Oh, yeah. You know, it, it's not like when you just stuck at your at, at, in DC or your home or Virginia. You go out and you meet so many different people. It definitely enriches you and it, it broadens your horizon. You see life from a different perspective. Right. You see real professional people a lot of times, and you get to interact with them and deal with them, and and all those sorts of things. 
it has made a great impression on the person that I am today because of my relationships that I had with people that I met along the basketball, you know, travel. I, I, I agree. Uh, I don't know what I would have did without the game of basketball mm -hmm. myself. You know, mm -hmm. it, it has brought so much to my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I friends like you, Brian, people who did I consider friends, mm -hmm. I met through the basketball realm mm -hmm. and just the relationships that you build and their friendships forever. And well, like when I was on my way here, man, Jarvis Bash and I called me to play that UNLV, you know, running Rebels and all that. And it's just like, you know, a fraternity. I talked to Mookie Blaylock, regular Harvey Grant, Stacy, all those guys. I talked to, you know, you know, a lot of, you know, ex players that I played with. I talked to the, today. I went up to Carroll to watch the football game. Mm -hmm. Carroll played Bullets. And the athletic director is Brian Ellaby. He was the head coach at Michigan. Me and him yeah. talked for about an hour while I was up there okay. today. So it's just, you know, a friendship and a connection that you make with people that's in, you know, the, you know, to the basketball thing that, you know, you just have a lifelong friendship, you know? Yep. Well, once again, I, uh, I want to thank you again for joining me, man. I appreciate everybody who's watching. Make sure you tune in each and every Wednesday at seven o'clock outside the game. I appreciate the love. Once again, Tyrone Jones, one of the best players to ever come out of the Washington, D.C. area. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for gracing my show with your appearance. Be safe. Everybody have a blessed evening. Until the next time. All right, Mike. Thanks for having me. No man. problem. Thank no you, problem. Bro. All right.